we can start with our two pieces of advice. And of course, if you've been around for a while, you always hear these, but they're good pieces of advice, so we always put them here. So piece of advice number one, do problems. And these problems were not that randomly written. They were written with intent. And so uh, these are good problems. They're not the only good problems that exist. There are older reviews. And there's uh, some questions on some old reviews that would be particularly relevant. But that's another story. Quiz, problems, things like that. And the piece of advice number two, take care of your health. We want you to make sure you enjoy, I was going to say enjoy the spring weather, but no, okay, so it's not quite the greatest spring weather we have right now, but hopefully later on in the week it'll get better. Get outside, get some fresh air, eat some good food, get plenty of rest, scream in your pillows as needed. All right, let's begin. Number one, oh, so many words. Okay, so let's see. Two tanks are set up so that brine, which is salt water, flows into, out of, and between them in such a way that all flows are constant and the amount of brine in each tank is not changing. So there's, there, nothing's going up nothing's going down. Okay, so the, the picture, and it's, it's good to sort of have this generic picture in mind. So we have our tank one, and we have our tank two, because we have two tanks. All right, we'll put some names here, tank one and tank two. And what do we have? Well, we have things come in, so those are our things coming in and they might be coming into both sides. We have things coming out, okay, and that's down here, things are coming out, and, uh, and then we have things going in between, okay. So we have flows between the tanks. All right, so, so that's our into, out of, and between. And so when you're dealing with a tank problem, and they love tank problems. This is a, a way to say, okay, what's happening? Somehow, they're interacting. And, and that's really the sort of the punchline of systems, is you have multiple things are happening, and they're interacting with each other. All right, so that's uh, the, basically the first part here. Now, the good thing is nothing is changing about water level. Things could change about water level, depending upon your flows. But here, we're not. Okay, moreover, we have the following information. The first tank has 30 gallons of brine. And we know that's not changing. And how do we know it's not changing? Well, uh, because it says the amount of brine in each tank is not changing. Okay, well, that's good. So we'll mark here, we have 30 gallons. And what do we can say? Well, coming into the tank from the outside, so that's this part where we have it coming in. We have information. Well, what does it say? It's one gallon per minute. So I'll put one G slash M, one gallon per minute, and a concentration of five ounces per gallon. Five ounces per gallon. And initially, at T equals zero, 15 ounces of salt in the tank. Well, okay, we'll put some initial conditions downstairs. At T equals zero, uh, we have 15 ounces. Now the second tank, okay, we'll come to our second tank. It has 36 gallons of brine, so we write down 36 gallons. And coming into the tank from the outside, fresh water at a rate of six gallons per minute. Now, if it's fresh water, how much salt is there? Zero. Zero. So fresh water means no salt. Zero ounces per gallon. Okay, and again, initially at t equals zero, there is no salt in the tank. Okay, 
Well, all right, that's more initial conditions. So there's initially at time zero, there's zero ounces. Now that will probably change. Okay, so we have all that lovely information. And then we have another paragraph. So given that initially at t equals zero, the rate of change for total amount of salt in the first tank is zero ounces per minute, while the rate of change for the total amount of salt in the second tank is increasing at three ounces per minute, then set up a system of differential equations that models this setup. So we want to find the differential equations that models this setup. And it says, use x of t for the amount of salt in the first tank, and you can't read it, and it says, and y of t for the amount of salt in the second tank. Now the reason you can't read it is, we're the math department, we don't have money. Our toner is running out. So when you become fabulously wealthy, and they approach you and you say, yes, I will give you hundreds of millions for a new building, but please also give $50 to the math department so we can afford to print. All right, okay, so, okay, so the, the punchline here is x of t, that's our tank here, tank one, amount of salt in tank one, and y, whoops, y of t, amount of salt in tank two. And let's parse this. Rate of change, when you see the word rate, what do you think? Derivative. So the rate of change for the total amount of salt in the first tank, okay, so that's x prime, and we're at time zero, is zero ounces per minute, so that's zero. And the rate of change, again, rate, derivative, y prime is zero, well, that's equal to three. Notice increasing means it's a plus three. It could be possible that it's decreasing. Actually, it can't be possible here. Why could it not possibly be decreasing in our setup? Salt yeah, there's no anti-salt, as someone says. There's no negative salt. So it has to be positive. But sometimes they might be sneaky and put in a decreasing, and you'd be like, oh, whoa. You forgot the sign, ha, 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 two points off for you. But would we ever do that? Yes. I would, oh, oh, I feel recognized. I feel seen, good. Uh, but I, I didn't write this problem, so. If there is such a problem on the exam, oh. hmm. Okay, all right. So, do we have the, do we understand everything we've written down so far? Yes. Now, what's missing? Well, normally if you want to set up our system, you'd like to know these rates. The rates that are leaving and the rates that are going in between. Do we have that information? Not yet, but we will. Okay, so the thing is, we've got to figure out what these rates are. This is what makes this problem fun. Okay, so let's think about it. How much total is coming in between the two tanks? Yeah, seven, right? One plus six. How much total has to be leaving the two tanks? Seven. Why does it have to be that the inflow equals the outflow? Yeah, the water levels aren't changing. Exactly, aha. So we know that whatever this rate of flow is, plus whatever that rate of flow is, has to add up to seven. So let's give this a name. What, do you, anyone have a favorite name for right now? <laughs> J. That's what I heard, J. So this has to be seven minus J. Okay, progress. Progress. All right. Now, let's see. Let's see if we can't reason a little bit. Uh, we still have to figure out these flows, and th there's not quite enough left for us to do that. Uh, but let's give one of them a name. What do you want to call this top flow here? What? F? All right. Exploring the alphabet. F. So we have F and we have J. Now, can we figure out what this flow needs to be? 
Ah, good. Let's cover this up for a second. We look at our inflows. What's coming into our tank? One and F. So when we write F here, F is a flow rate. So this is F gallons per minute, just like J here. This is the J gallons per minute. So coming in is one plus F. Yes? Good. So what has to be going out? If one plus F comes in, what needs to go out? Well, if one plus F comes in, one plus F has to go out. Why? Water level isn't changing. When the water level doesn't change, inflows equal outflow. So what's our outflow? Well, part of it's J and then this other part. So whatever this part is, this plus, well, this part plus J has to equal F plus 1. Yes? So this becomes, if you just do a little bit of fancy math, 1 plus F minus J. Okay. Cool. Now, we almost have it, except we don't know what F and J are. So once we figure that out, everything will be super simple. I mean, it might change what these numbers are. It won't change the final answer at the end. Like, we could have reasoned things from looking at this as well. We could have said, oh, well, what's leaving this tank? I see F and 7 minus J. That has to match what's coming into this tank, which is 6 in this other part. And then you'll still get, there's a couple ways to approach it. But the, the, the moral is there's two things we don't know. So up to two pieces of information. It looks like there's four things we don't know. But because water levels aren't changing, it's actually secretly two things that we don't know. And somehow I got crooked there. Okay, so now, oh, what do we do? Well, let's set up our system. So, x prime. Now, remember, when you're writing down the equations for tanks, you have your inflow, you subtract your outflow. So, in minus out. So we have some in. We'll do the easy part from the outside. That's 5. And then we're going to add to that. What else? So we have this part coming in from the second tank. Now remember, x is the amount of salt. So how much salt is coming from the second tank? F times y. Well, there's going to be something times y. That's true. Something times y. But what is the something? Uh, six. Zero. I'll give you a hint. It's a fraction. It's something over 36. What was the top? F. F over 36. Now you're probably thinking, ah. So that's why we come to the review. So we can be like, oh yeah, that's right. So how do we figure out how much salt there is? Well, there's a couple ways to think about it. Here's one way, which is not quite the way I've written it down. But you can think of it as you have a, a rate times a concentration. And that gives you the amount of salt. So like 1 times 5, there was a rate and there was a concentration. That gives you the rate of flow of the salt. Well, what's the rate of flow? It's F. What's the concentration? Well, now you say, well, to find the concentration, I say how much salt is there, which is Y, divide by how much liquid is there, which is 36 gallons. So the rate would be here F, and then Y over 36. Okay, so that's the inflow. Subtract the outflow. 
Okay, so what do we subtract? Well, I'll give you a hint, it's something times x. So how much leaves? Well, part of the thing that leaves is the j over 30, but there's also another avenue over here. 1 plus f minus j over so total, how much leaves? 1 plus f. That's our rate, that's slowing out. And then you need a, an x over 30 would be our concentration. OK, good. Now, now that we've had practice, we get to do it again. Y prime. How much salt is coming from the outside? Zero, because it's pure water coming in. No salt is coming from the outside. So, all right, well, that's good news. All right, add to that. Do we have any other source of salt? Tank one. From tank one. Okay, and how much is coming from tank one? Again, a fraction. One plus F minus J over 30. So the one plus F minus J is your rate. X over 30 is your concentration. Minus something over Y. Sorry, what? Oh, wow. You're faster than me. But okay. Uh, let's see. We take our outflows, right, which are these two, right? Because this is going to the first tank. This is just leaving all together. So that would be 7 minus J plus F over 36, right? Yeah, so be careful here. It's not just these two. You have to say which ones are actually going out. Well, we're basically done. We have our system, but we don't know F and J. Uh, is there anything we haven't used yet? We haven't used initial conditions. So we know what X prime is zero is. We know what Y prime is zero is. We actually know more. This 15, that's really x of 0. And this 0 is really y of 0. So let's plug everything in now. OK, so we, we're going to plug in at t equals 0. OK, and so we have x prime of 0 is equal to 5 plus uh, f over 36 times y of 0. But what's y of zero? Zero. zero. Gone. Ha! Ha ha ha! Zero. Okay. Then subtract, and we have 1 plus f over 30 times 15. But x prime of zero is zero. Great. This is great. This is good for us. We're making progress here. Uh, let's see. What can we say here? Well, 15 does go into 30, so let's go ahead and do that little math there. And then we can move this across. So this becomes 5 is equal to 1 plus f over 2. Yes? So I've just moved that across. So 1 plus f is equal to 10. So what's f? 9. So now we know that this is 9 gallons per minute. Cool. Well, the other flow is 10 minus J, but we don't know J yet. So it's not as satisfying yet. We'll wait till it's satisfying. We want to be satisfied. OK, well, that was the first part. Now let's look at Y prime is 0. 
So y prime is 0. Well, that's 0, which we don't need to write down. And we know what f is. So 1 plus f, that's our 10 minus j over 30 times our x of 0, which is 15. And y of 0 is 0 again, which is great. And all of that, y prime is 0, is equal to 3. OK, so again, 15 goes into 30. We get 10 minus j over, oh, I'm almost off the page here. 10 minus j over 2 is equal to 3. That says 10 minus j is equal to 6. So j is equal to 4. Ah, so 4 and 3 and 1 plus 9. Subtract 4, 6. So now we have everything except space to write the answer. But that's OK. They made spare trees. Paper grows on trees. There's abundant amount. OK, so we, we have our conclusion here. We'll again make notes f equals 9, j equals 4. And so. Our system, because remember, what's our goal? You always remember what our goal is. Set up a system of differential equations. So we can say our system is x prime is equal to 5 plus, now f is 9, so 9 over 36, 1 fourth y. 1 plus f is 10, so that's minus 10 over 30 also known as one-third x. And y prime, that's equal to, well, to 0, 0. And 1 plus f minus j, that was 6. It's off the screen, but it's up there. So 6 over 30, also known as one-fifth x. And uh, 7 minus j, 7 minus j is 3, plus f is 12. 12 over 36 is one-third y. So there's our answer. Now, they might ask you to write it in a different form. So perhaps they said, well, we want you to write the system, but give us our answer in the following form. x of t, or really x prime of t, is equal to a of t, x of t, plus f of t. They may ask you for that form. So what do you do then? Well, in that case, our answer would look like our x. Now here, it's hard for me to write this, but you have to imagine that's a bold x, meaning a vector x. x prime would equal your a of t x plus your other stuff. So this part right here, this is the the non-homogeneous part, the part that's not attached to x and y. So in this case, it is 5 and 0. And here, you group your coefficients. So just make sure you get your coefficients in, in the right place. So it would be minus 1 third, 1 fourth, and then 1 fifth, and minus 1 third. So this would be if they asked in matrix form. That's what they'd want. So be careful to put them in the right place. Uh, by the way, on a side note, why did they put an of t here? Right, t stands for time, but there's no t here. Now, x and y are functions of t, but a could also be functions of t. I have a question. Okay. Yes. Yes. That's why I wrote it in a different color. Oh, wait, no, no. I wrote it in a different color because I have this obsession of using all my pens equally. I love all my pens. It's supposed to be a bold x here. Bold x means vector, vector function, whereas these just mean individual functions. Now, the reason that there, there, there could be a t is if you're, it's ever the case if your water levels are changing with time, 
your coefficients will change with time, and you'll actually have functions of time in here. That's okay to have functions of time. It just means your water levels are changing. So just be open to the possibilities. All right, that was probably the hardest problem. It's all downhill from here, right? Any questions? I had fun with this one. I had fun with this one. The only sad thing is now I can't put it on the exam because it's on the review. I know. I know. Sad times. Well, I wait 10 years, then I can do it. Number two, find a single differential equation satisfied for x with no terms involving y given the following x double prime minus x plus y prime plus 2y is t squared plus 3 sine t. x prime plus 3x minus y double prime equals 4e to the minus 2t. And you do not need to solve the resulting differential equation. Um, I, I will say for a test involving differential equations, I would say half of this exam coming up, you don't actually have to solve it. So there's lots of things where it's about setting up or doing other things related to it. So you aren't going to have to solve too many. So that's nice. We, we like this sentence. It's our favorite, favorite sentence. Okay, so when you see a problem like this, what's our tool? Method of also known as Kramer's rule. Elimination. So the idea here is we're trying to eliminate one of the two functions, either x or y. Sometimes it might ask for both, but usually just ask for one or the other. And you say, okay, so what's the process? Well, process, uh, the way I like to do it and the way I encourage you to do it when faced with a problem, is to say, okay, we're going to rewrite this and so remember, this uses our D notation, where D stands for derivative. So this problem is brought to you by the letter D. All right, so what do we have? What does that mean? Well, it means that X double prime becomes D squared X. And you have minus X. Y prime is DY and 2Y. That's t squared plus 3 sine t. x prime, that's our d times x, 3x, and y double prime is d squared y. Okay, so that's what we mean by the denotation. Wherever you see derivatives, put d. So if you see second derivative, d squared. Third derivative, d cubed. Now, the next thing is you want to basically group. Now, in other words, put x's in front of y's. In this case, they were very nice. And we're going to read off our coefficients. What comes in front of our x's? Well, there's d squared minus 1. What comes in front of our y's? d plus 2. And then next line, in front of our x's, d plus 3. And in front of our y's, minus d squared. And multiplying by x, y, and what we're doing here is we're putting things into matrices. t squared plus 3 sine t, 4e to the minus 2t. Okay, so the right-hand side, that goes in. That's pretty straightforward, and we're reading off our coefficients. So we're grouping x parts, y parts, x parts, y parts on all the lines. Okay, so now the beautiful part. So we have to figure out what are we solving for? And this is when we have to read the problem. Well, we should always read the problem. We're solving for x. Cool. So here's the punchline. If you know you're solving for x, you're going to, on the left hand side, it's like you're taking a determinant because you're taking a determinant. And it's just the determinant that you see. And it's that determinant times x. On the right-hand side, 
Now what you have to do is you have to think a little bit. We know we're solving for x, and so the reason I put x here is that's what we're solving for. Since we're solving for x, you say, okay, which one of these columns is the x column? The first or the second? The first. So then you say, I'm going to replace the x column by these functions. t squared plus 3 sine t, 4 e to the minus 2t, but these other columns, in this case there's only one other column, stays as is. So this is Kramer's rule, and Kramer's rule is essentially an automation for the method of elimination. Okay, we're most of the way done. So once you've got into sort of this step, you know, this framework, write things using denotation, put it into matrices, apply Kramer's rule, then you just clean it up and finish it up, taking your determinants. So, d squared minus 1 times minus d squared, so going down the diagonal, subtract, other way, d plus 3, d plus 2. All of that times x. We will clean that up in a moment. Equals, okay, again the diagonals. Now, always put the d terms first. That's just convention. So minus d squared times t squared plus 3 sine t subtract, because we're going up the diagonal, d plus 2, 4 e to the minus 2t. Okay. Well, we can probably fit it in. What comes next? Expanding. Expanding. Algebra. Wow. You guys didn't realize when you signed up for this class, this was an algebra class. But it's a uh, it's true story. Okay, so, well, minus d to the fourth plus d squared. Okay, that's our, we're expanding here. Subtract, well, okay, let's do d squared. We have 2d and 3d, that makes 5ds and a 6. All of that times x. All right, we'll come back. Okay, do we simplify anything? Well, we have a d squared and a subtract d squared, so those will cancel. That's good news. So we have minus d to the fourth, subtract 5d, subtract 6, times x. Okay, that's the left-hand side. Equals, got to do the right-hand side. Okay, so... This is minus d squared times t squared minus d squared times 3 sine t. And this is minus d4 e to the minus 2t and minus 8 uh, e to the minus 2t. If I see this right. Okay, so I see d squared. What does that tell me to do to t squared? Derive it twice. Derive it twice. Did I? Okay, derive twice. What's the second derivative of t squared? Uh, two. two. Don't forget the minus sign. Okay, a similar d squared. We're taking two derivatives. Now, three is a constant. Cool, cool, cool. Second derivative of sine. Negative, Negative sine. sine. Don't forget the minus. Don't forget the three plus 3 sine t. Okay. This d says take the derivative. What's the derivative of 4 e to the minus 2t? Wait a second, we can just cancel the last two terms. Well, we can once we figure out what happens. So what's the derivative of 4 e to the minus 2t? Negative 8 e to the minus 2t, right? Don't forget the minus, so there's a plus 8 e to the minus 2t, a minus 8 e to the minus 2t, they will cancel, but it won't always cancel, but in this case it does. So we're almost there. Okay, so here we go. So now we get rid of the d notation. d to the fourth times x means four derivatives. So minus the fourth derivative of x, then minus five x prime, because that's d times x, minus six x 
equals minus 2 plus 3 sine t. Now, if you don't like so many negatives, as you might say, I'm an optimist. Okay, no problem. Multiply both sides by a negative sign. Other thing you can do is if you don't like to write a bunch of dashes, you can put x parenthesis 4. That also means the same thing as fourth derivative. So the fourth derivative of x, 5 times the first derivative of x, plus 6 times x equals 2 minus 3 sine t. This is another way to write the answer. All right, so that's our method of elimination. Any questions on that? Good, good. Number three. Now on the last exam, number three, that's when you got to see my problem. But on this exam, you'll get to see my problem at number three. I also wrote number three. I'll go ahead. I'll take all the blame now. It, it will be interesting. A fun little wrinkle. But it'll be a pleasant wrinkle. It'll be a satisfying wrinkle. All right, so what does this one say? Uh, consider the system t cubed x prime, which is t squared 1, 3t to the fourth t squared x. So this is an example where you have non-constant coefficients. Oh, OK. How do we solve such a thing? And the answer is we don't. We, we don't have the tools developed to do that. So what can we do if that happens? Well, basically, they have to give us something, and we have to work with it. So if you see things with complicated coefficients, you, the good news is you don't have to solve it, but you do have to know how to work with things. So we're going to do three things. Part A, verify. Now, if you see the word verify on the exam, this is a happy word. Because whenever you see the word verify, you know that means free points. They just want to hand out points. Because what does that do? Well, we have to verify that these two are solutions. So how do we get our free points? Well, how do you verify something? You plug it in. And you're going to plug it in, and you check that things match. And if they match, you're done. And if they don't match, you know you didn't get it right, do it again. So you, so you have a way to check whether or not you got it right. So you love Verify. Now, plugging it in, by the way, is a great tool if you say, well, I think something is a solution, but I may have to tweak something. You, what do you do? You plug it in. You say, OK, what do I have to tweak? OK, so we'll do our part A, Verify. So Verify, we have two sides. So we'll do uh, our x1 first, and then we have our left-hand side. So we say, OK, so we're going to take t cubed times x prime. So how do you take the derivative when there's a vector involved? Take the derivative of each part. So the derivative of t squared is 2t. Derivative of t to the fourth is 4t cubed. And then we say, OK, we multiply this out. That's our 2t to the fourth, and that makes 8t to the sixth. That's the left-hand side. Right-hand side. Well, we have our t squared 1, 3t to the 4th t squared. And we're going to multiply it by t squared t to the 4th. We say, OK, well, that's t to the 4th plus t to the 4th. All right, we're doing our matrix multiplication. Do, going across the row, down the column t to the 4th plus t to the 4th. Then we have 3t to the 6th plus t to the 6th. Oh, I can't multiply 1 times 4. That's what happened. See, that's, see I, I was saying, like, wait, that doesn't match. I was like, oh, I made a mistake. See, I caught my mistake because I knew it was free points. 2t to the 4th. 4t to the 6. And now, after I caught my mistake, what do we do? We say, aha, these match. So that's the verify. So you just plug in the left-hand side, plug in the right-hand side, show that they match, 
and your verification's done. Except we have to do it twice. This is the problem so nice, you get to do it twice. All right, so x2, left-hand side. Again, t cubed. Take the derivative. Derivative of t to the negative 2. Negative 2, t to negative 3, right? Power comes down, subtract 1 from the power. Derivative of negative 3, 0. Okay, multiply these together. Well, t cubed times t to negative 3 leaves us with negative 2, and 0 times t cubed is 0. Right hand side. All right. We have our t squared 1, 3t to the fourth, t squared, t to the negative 2, negative 3. t squared times t to the negative 2 is 1. 1 times negative 3 is negative 3. So it's 1 subtract 3. 3t three to the fourth times t to the negative 2, that's 3t squared. t squared times negative 3 is negative 3t squared, which becomes negative 2 upstairs, 0 downstairs, and they match. All right. So we're happy. All right, so that's verified. Plug it in. Make them, make sure they agree. Okay. Are we ready for part B? Yeah, yeah okay, woo! Enthusiasm. All right. You're like, but B isn't three points. Well, that's okay, we'll still do it. So part B, find the Ronskian of these solutions. So we're looking for the Ronskian x1, x2. All right, how do we find such a thing? Well, it's a determinant. What we do is we make a, a matrix and in the first column, you put x1, t squared, t to the fourth. And in the second column, you put x2, t to the negative 2, negative 3. And now you take this determinant. t squared times negative 3 is minus 3t squared. t to the fourth times t to the negative 2 is t squared, but we need to subtract it because of the rule of determinants, right? We add the diagonal going down, subtract the diagonal going up, and so we have minus 4t squared. Okay, so this, is, this was part b. And that's it for part b. That leaves us with part c and some room, which is good. We probably need it. All right, so what's part c asking us? Find the solution to the system satisfying that at time 1, we are at 7, negative 1. Well, whoa, whoa. Sorry, what? Is the wrong scene a what, a what? Well, I mean, every matrix is a matrix of vectors. You're, you're, you're thinking of old school Ronskian. There's two kinds of Ronskians. There's Ronskians in phase one of the class, and there's Ronskians in phase two of the class. And there the two shall meet. So you make sure you know what, what, what part of the class we're in. So in this part of the class, it's just only the columns. The columns are the solutions. That's it. So in the earlier part of the course, you had to take the derivatives of things. We're not doing that. That, that's not what we're doing here. So make sure you know how to do the Ronskins in this part of the class. So, all right, okay, lots of, oh, wow. the Ronskins is not very controversial. We should have put more questions about Ronskins on the exam. Or have we already? Oh. Okay. Well, let's move on to part C. While, while people discuss. So find the solution. Well, is it x1? Now, be careful here. Notice there's a x at time 1, not at time 0. So it's uh, slightly different, but that's all right. If you plug in 1 into x1, you get 1, 1. Well, that's not 7, negative 1. If you plug 1 into x2, you get 1, negative 3. Well, that's not 7, negative 1. So it's not x1 and it's not x2. 
So how are we going to find the solution which works? Because it's not one of the ones they gave us. Superposition. Yes. This is driving home the idea. It's a wonderful idea. It's a super idea that says, hey, these are nice differential equations in that they're linear. And so you can combine solutions together. So that says we are looking for something of the form some constant c times x1 plus some constant d times x2. In fact, all solutions have to look like this. So we'll go ahead and write this as c times t squared t to the fourth plus d t to negative 2, negative 3. Well, how do we find c and d? That's where we plug in. So we know that 7, negative 1, is what happens when we plug 1 into our system. So that's equal to c times 1, 1 plus d, 1, negative 3. Or if you like, c plus d, I'm just adding on the first entries, and c subtract 3d if you add on the second entries. Okay. This leads us to two equations, namely that c plus d should give us 7, and c subtract 3d should give us negative 1. Do you see where those are coming from? Good. Well, there, you can do lots of things, but, but, but yes. Ultimately, the goal is you have two equations and two unknowns, and this is... We want to get comfortable with this. I, I've had engineering professors say, your students don't know how to solve two equations and two unknowns. <sighs> please, if you don't learn anything else in math, please know how to solve two equations and two unknowns. OK, so there's lots of ways. I like to use elimination. If we use subtraction, for instance, we can eliminate the c's. So c subtract c is 0. d subtract negative 3d is 4d. 7 subtract negative 1 is 8, so d is 2. c plus 2 equals 7, so c is 5. So, what's our answer? Well, we go back and put in c and d. So we have 5, t squared, t to the fourth, and then plus 2, t to the negative 2, negative 3. And we can push them together into a single function. So 5t squared plus 2t to the negative 2, 5t to the fourth, minus 6. And that's our desired solution. Will we get points off if we didn't simplify it to that? If, if from here to here, uh, it doesn't matter. Right. If, if you stopped there, then you'd lose points. But if you stop there, you're, you're good to go. Okay. All right. Are we ready to move on? Okay. Number four. And, and the next three are, are closely related to one another. So it's four, five, six, they, they form a nice group. We'll talk about them as we get closer to the end. As at once we hit number six, we'll come back and probably talk about four and five again. So number four, find the general form for solutions to the system. And here we have x prime equals 2x plus y, y prime equals minus 5x plus 4y. So they've given us this system as separate equations. But we look at this and say, ah, these are very nice equations. There's no you know, functions of t floating around. There's no extra non-homogeneous stuff floating around. This is our favorite kind. So we're going to turn this into a matrix problem. So we're going to introduce, I'll call it z so we don't confuse ourselves too much, but essentially we're going to stack our functions one on top of the other. So we're going to think of z as x in the first slot, y in the second slot. So that this can be rewritten as z prime is equal to a matrix times z. And now, what's the matrix? 
it's the coefficients. So 2, 1, negative 5, 4. Now, I will say, about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, they were very sneaky and they put like 4y minus 5x. And a lot of people put 4, negative 5. And they, the pro person who wrote that problem, me, uh, had set it up so that it was still beautiful. So you had no suspicion that something was, had gone astray. We gave you partial credit. But, but the moral is, make sure that you put things in the right order. You know, we know that it's super easy just to sort of like not think. And, uh, and I understand part of our goal is to get you to not think too much, but we want you to think the right amount. Pay attention, pay attention. All right, so now we have a matrix, and this is our first time we're going through this process. So we're gonna talk about our eigenvalue method. So let's just recall what we need to do. So we have our, our two by two matrix, we need to get the eigenvalue. So if you have a two by two matrix, and you're trying to ask something, there's, there's three categories, right? There's find a particular solution, find a general solution, or there's something about finding, um, well, I'll say the exponential, you know, e to the at. Um, but okay, we're, we're here, finding eigenvalues. It's always gonna be your first step. So if I wanna find the eigenvalues of a, the important thing is I'm going to take the determinant of a minus lambda i and set it equal to zero. So this is a polynomial. So we're going to have to learn to do these kinds of computations. So in this case, well, so we're going to take the determinant of, you take your matrix and you just subtract lambda on the diagonal term. So 2 minus lambda, 1, negative 5, 4 minus lambda. Okay, so we get two minus lambda times four minus lambda, subtract negative five times one, set it equal to zero. Well, minus lambda times minus lambda, that's lambda squared. Then we have minus two lambda, minus four lambda, so that's minus six lambda. And then we have an eight and a plus five, plus 13. Lambda squared minus six lambda plus 13 equals zero. Okay, does this factor nicely? No, oh, you, you jumped right to that no. All right, well if it doesn't factor, what can you do? Try harder. Try harder, okay. Uh, quadratic formula also works. Completing the square is your other idea. All right, well, quadratic formula, why not? Negative, whoops, not lambda squared, lambda. Negative b, six, plus minus the square root, uh, b squared, 36, minus four ac. Four times 13 is 52. That's easy for us to remember because there's four suits in a deck of cards, 13 cards in each suit. So 52 decks, 52 cards, uh, all over 2a. Okay, 36 subtract 52. Negative 16. By the way, the people who wrote this test were given instructions. The numbers should come out relatively nicely. So if you're getting really weird numbers for your eigenvalues, like square root of 17, double check your work. Something has happened. All right. So uh, square root of negative 16. 4i. Four Four I. So 6 over 2 makes 3. And then you have plus or minus 4i over 2, which is 2i. Okay, so here are our eigenvalues. Ah, good times. Good times. Okay, so now we know our eigenvalues are complex. Oh, nice. Okay, so what's the procedure? Now, the thing is, you really, it turns out there are three cases for our eigenvalues. There are... Both eigenvalues are real, but they're distinct numbers. Both eigenvalues are real, but they're the same number. And then you have things are complex. And know how to handle each case. 
Now, how do you handle complex? Well, for complex, you just say, look, everything comes in pairs. The eigenvalues came in pairs, that's that plus minus. So the eigenvectors come in pairs, and we can use that to actually figure out the solutions. Okay, so let's start with, we pick one. I always pick the plus one because I'm an optimist. 3 plus 2i. And we are after the eigenvector associated with 3 plus 2i. So, how do you find eigenvector? We'll just do, a, again, a little quick recall. So finding an eigenvector, you're looking for, you take a minus lambda i times something, and we want to get out 0. And now the question is, how do you find that something? That's the goal. So this, this is, you know, this is your eigenvector. So, okay, so for lambda equals 3 plus 2i, so we're going to have 2 subtract 3 plus 2i, 1 minus 5, and then we're going to have 4 subtract 3 plus 2i, and then times it by something, and we want to get out 0, 0. Uh, well, before I do that, I'm going to actually clean this up. 2 subtract 3 plus 2i, that's minus 1 minus 2i. 1, downstairs, minus 5, and here it's, it's going to be 1 subtract 2i. Okay, times something, 0, 0. How do you find that? Well, there's a couple ways to find it, but what I find to be the easiest is I pick a row which it has something in it somewhere. So I don't want to pick a row of all zeros, but that's good. I don't have any rows of all zeros. And now I copy it backwards. So 1 minus 1 minus 2i. And then I do one last tweak as I pick an entry and I flip the signs. I'll make this entry all positives. And there's my eigenvector. Yes? Are you familiar with this? So. So if you have your minus 1 minus 2i1, write it backwards. So 1 minus 1 minus 2i, but then flip a sign on one of the two entries. And you can go through and check that, in fact, this works. This does give you 0 here. And if you play around with this long enough, it does give you 0 there. It's just automatic. OK. How do we use this? Well, we remember that our solutions should look like e to the lambda t times v. That's just a general idea, that our, our solutions, e to the eigenvalue t times eigenvector. So we say, OK, so e to the 3 plus 2i t, how do we handle that? Well, that's e to the 3 t cosine 2 t plus i e to the 3 t sine 2 t. Okay, so this part right here, this is our e to the lambda t. And then we say our eigenvector, well, we're going to also pull this apart. So we're going to have the real part plus an imaginary part. So this is our vector v. So we, we took our e to the lambda t, expanded it. We took our v and expanded it. And now we do algebra again. We're going to FOIL. And we're going to end up with two parts. Parts which don't involve i, and parts which do involve i. We call these the real and the complex. OK, so for the real part, you could, for instance, take real times real, or you could take imaginary times imaginary. So you end up with e to the 3t cosine 2t, 1, 1. Okay, that's real, real. Imaginary, imaginary, because you have i and i, that's i squared, so you introduce a minus. 
e to the 3t sine 2t, 0, 2. Okay, that's the real part. Then everything else is the imaginary part. Okay, so we add i. So now we take our real times the imaginary part. So that's e to the 3t cosine 2t, 0, 2. And then we take our imaginary part times our real part. So that's our e to the 3t sine 2t times 1, 1. All right. Good. We are going to come back and do this one again. We're not even done yet. But we're like two-thirds done. We've done the hard part. What's, what, have, what do we have now? We have solution number one is the real part, and solution number two is the imaginary part. Now the reason that these are solutions is we're actually combining the, re, the two roots. Remember how we said our eigenvalues came in pairs, 3 plus minus 2i? So it's by combining both of them that we can say, oh, just the real part by itself is a solution, and just the imaginary part by itself is a solution. OK. Uh, I'm, I'm out of space here, so I'm going to go continue on. So that says z looks like some constant c times our first solution, e to the 3t cosine 2t, 1, 1, minus e to the 3t sine 2t, 0, 2, and plus some constant d times our second solution, e to the 3t cosine 2t, 0, 2, plus e to the 3t sine 2t, <coughs> excuse me, 1, 1. There we go. Okay, so that's the general form for z. Did I copy something down wrong? Where did where, this i go? Yeah. Well, we're just saying i is a constant. Oh. And, and it's a weird constant. It's not the kind of constant you see everywhere. But it's like 5. So it got absorbed by the d, is how you can think of it. All right. Is this our answer? Well, no. We could, and this is not the problem, I could write this as e to the 3t cosine 2t, and then e to the 3t cosine 2t minus 2 e to the 3t sine 2t. And uh, I'm just squeezing it into one vector here, plus d e to the 3t sine of 2t, and then 2 e to the 3t cosine 2t plus e to the 3t sine 2t. Is this our answer? No. And you're probably like, ugh. Oh. Maybe this doesn't have an answer. That's a tricky one. What's our issue? How is this problem presented to us? As two separate equations. It did not have z in it. We introduced z. So if we introduce something, we have to remove it. So how do we remove it? So the punchline here, the reason this is not the solution, is this is equal to xy. We want x equals something, y equals something. So what do we do? Well, well we unvector, right? We just read off the top entries, and we read off the bottom entries. So x is some constant e to the 3t cosine 2t plus some constant d 
e to the 3t sine 2t. And then y is some constant c, e to the 3t cosine 2t minus 2 e to the 3t sine 2t plus, again, some constant d, 2 e to the 3t cosine 2t plus e to the 3t sine 2t. Okay, just reading off the first entries, reading off the second entries. Now is this our answer? Yes. Beautiful. See, and you can write it on one line. Wow. Okay. We will come back and revisit this problem. This is not the way you want to do this problem. Or maybe it is. And if you like this way, do it. Uh, Kramer's method doesn't work here. So Kramer's method is uh, more elimination. So there's no elimination going on here. But, but there is something else we can use to do this problem, which we'll come back and visit. I promise you, when you see the second method, you're going to be like, why did you show us this first method? Well, we have reasons, just so you can appreciate what you have. Okay. Number five, solve x prime is 7, 4, minus 1, 3, x, and x of 0 is 3, 1. So this now, this is an initial value problem. So there, we, we want the initial solution. Cool. Okay, so we say, okay, we see a matrix. We're, we're going to channel our solve things with matrices mindset which means we're going to start by finding eigenvalues. So let's find our eigenvalues. So what do we have? Well, we're going to take the determinant of A minus lambda I. So we subtract lambda off the things on the diagonal. Everything else stays as is. So we're going to set that equal to 0. So we have 7 minus lambda times 3 minus lambda subtract negative 1 times 4. This will give us lambda squared minus 3 lambda minus 7 lambda, so that's minus 10 lambda. And uh, we'll have 21 plus 4 plus 25. Does that factor? Yeah. How does it factor? Minus 5 and minus 5. Okay, so last time we were doing something complex. Now there's no complex part. It's repeated parts. Repeated roots. Okay, now what's the problem with repeated roots? Well, the, the issue is that anytime you'll see repeated roots in, in our class, it's going to be supremely boring. Uh, sorry, uh, it'll not be supremely boring. All the boring cases never happen. So we're going to have something happen here. Okay, so we're going to, again, start by doing our eigenvalues. So we're going to take our a minus lambda i. So imagine I put in lambda equals 5. So we have uh, 7 minus 5 is 2, 4 minus 1, 3 minus 5 is negative 2. And we're going to multiply it by something. We want to get 0, 0. Okay. So, what can we put here? <coughs> 2, negative 1. Now, I should say this is not unique. There's lots of choices that you could have made. So, so if you were like, oh, I got 4, negative 2. It's like, yeah, cool. You're, you're awesome. That also works. You know, there's lots of things that could have happened. So, okay, so 2, negative 1. So here's our first eigenvector. But there's two eigenvalues, so we should hope for two eigenvectors. Do we have a second eigenvector? No. No, so if you see repeated eigenvalues, 
you will not have enough eigenvectors. So <clears throat> you're going to come up short. That's okay. That's okay. So we have to know how to deal with them. So here's the, the general game plan. So we say, okay, solution one, well, that's going to look like e lambda t times v. In other words, e to your eigenvalue times t times eigenvector. Life is good. We can handle that. But solution two, if we're coming up short, well, it's going to be e eigenvalue t. You're going to bump by adding a factor of t, so it's t times v, but that alone is not enough, plus a little extra. Now, this eigenvector, this is what we're calling v. So how do you find w? Well, so the answer is, you write down your same matrix, 2, 4, minus 1, minus 2, times something, and now you're going to put your v on the left, sorry, the right-hand side. And you ask the question, what do I put here? Now, there's lots of choices, but don't be creative. Be uncreative. Do you see a nice choice? Well, well, one zero will work, or you could do zero a half, or there's other things you can do. But I think one zero is the simplest one. Yes? Because you can check. Essentially, it says take 1 times the first column plus 0 times the second column, and oh, yeah, that does look like 2, negative 1, because 2, negative 1 is the first column. All right. So we say, great, good news. We now know what our solutions look like. So x1 looks like, and uh, lambda is 5, so that's e to the 5t times... 2, negative 1, and x2 looks like e to the 5t times t times 2, negative 1, plus 1, 0. So those are our two solutions. Now we're after a particular solution, and unfortunately none of them by themselves work, but that's okay. Once we have our two solutions, what do we do? <coughs> Well, we say all solutions are combinations of these. Some constant times the first, plus some constant times the second. All right. Cool. So we know that all solutions look like some constant e to the 5t, 2 negative 1, plus some constant e to the 5t, times t, 2 negative 1, plus 1, 0. Okay. How do you find C and D? Because we are after a particular solution. This is the general form. We, we don't want the general form. What do we want? Yeah, we, we have initial values. So, so we say, okay, now we use our initial conditions. And we say, what's happening to our scenario? at t equals 0. So we have that x of 0, which is 3, 1. Now e to the 0 is nice, so that's just 1. E to, the, e to the 0 is 1. So we end up with some constant c, 2, negative 1. Then d, e to the 0 is 1. t equals 0 knocks that term out, so we have plus d times 1, 0. So that leads us to two equations, 3 equals 2c plus d, and 1 equals negative c. So, well, hmm, I suppose we could uh, multiply the second equation by 2 and add to cancel, but that seems silly, because really we just say, hey, I know how to solve for c. c is negative 1. So that says 3 equals negative 2 plus d, right? Because if c is negative 1, 2c is negative 2. So what is d? 5. Five. So 
our final answer then becomes x is equal to minus 1, so that's a minus, e to the 5t, 2 negative 1, plus d, so that's plus 5, e to the 5t, times t, 2 negative 1, plus 1, 0. Sorry, I went kind of weird there. And you can, you don't have to, this is a perfectly fine answer, but you could push it a little bit further. Say, hey, that's e to the 5t times, well, 5t times 2 makes a 10 times t. Then you have a minus 2, and a plus 5 makes plus 3. And then you have uh, 5 times, again, minus 1 times t, that's minus 5t. There's a plus 1, and, uh, well, that's all there is, so plus 1. So there's our solution. Okay, so that's number five. That's one way to do number five. Yes? Um, so, when you're finding the vector after multiplying the eigenvalue by t, then the new matrix is the top bit. Do we have to use, like on the exam, do we have to use like the row echelon form to find the new matrix, or can we just guess? You can just do it like this. But I'm going to show you something better. There's a better way. And I know you're like, why are you showing us the terrible ways? So that you can appreciate the beauty that comes. Number six. Okay. Find e to the at for the following matrices. So you have a is the matrix 4, minus 1, 3, 0. b is the matrix 4, minus 2, 2, 0. c is the matrix 4, negative 5, 1, 0. Now, this problem will take some time because there are three parts. However, among all the problems, this one has something going for it. What's special about this problem versus all the problems that we've done so far? Oh, no, no, no. We're definitely going there. We're definitely doing the lambdas. Well, fundamental matrices, but there's something else. There's something called the equation sheet. And on the equation sheet, there are exactly three pieces of information that have been added relevant to this part of the class. All of them have to do with exponential matrices. So the first one, e to the at, is phi of t, phi zero, inverse. The second formula says e to the at is equal to e to the lambda t times the identity plus t times a minus lambda i. And the third equation says e to the a t is equal to e to the alpha t cosine beta t times i uh, plus 1 over beta e to the alpha t sine beta t times a minus alpha i. Those are all on the equation sheet. So, let's talk about these. Somebody mentioned this one. e to the a t, e to the lambda t times identity plus t times a minus lambda i. When does this apply? Repeated roots. So if you see repeated roots, you say, ah, I can get e to the a t quickly. It is a friend. How about this last one? What does it look like? Yeah, you see imaginary stuff. Whenever you see sines and cosines, that's complex. And in particular, that's alpha plus minus beta i. So if you see complex roots, this equation, that's your friend. What's the first one for? Everything else. Well, what is everything else? 
Which means what? Yeah. Real and distinct. I don't, now, technically, it applies to all scenarios, but that's when we're going to pull it out. So once we know our setting, we know which of the three formulas. So there are three different things we have to do. Now, of the three, which one do we least want to do? Yeah, the top one is going to be the most work. Uh, what does phi represent here? Fundamental matrix. What is a fundamental matrix? It's all your solutions packed together into a matrix. So what you do is you find all your solutions, and each column is a solution. OK. Now, let's finish this one, and then we'll talk about why we love these so much. So, uh, yeah, my, my artistic skills are not very good, but, but imagine that I could be a good artist. We, when we see that E to the AT, we just love it. It's, it's our favorite thing. We love E to the AT. Okay. All right. So which one do you want to tackle first? A. Okay. I don't know. Let's find out. So step one, you always have to find your eigenvalues. Whenever you're faced with a two by two matrix with numbers, you got to do it. You just, you're going to be doing it. Okay, so okay, so we have our four minus lambda minus one, three, zero minus lambda makes minus lambda. So that's going to give us lambda squared minus four lambda plus three equals zero. Okay, we've done a few of these, so I'm I'm, I'm not going to take quite as long as, as we have before. Uh, does this factor? Yes. What does it factor as? Okay, so what setting are we in? Our first one. Real eigenvalues, but they're distinct numbers. <sighs> the hard case. Okay, but that's all right. Well, what do we do? We've got to find our eigenvalues. Sorry, we've got to find our eigenvectors for each eigenvalue. So, we'll start with 1. So, I'm going to put in 1 wherever I see a lambda, so we have 3 minus 1, 3 minus 1, times some vector, we want to get 0, 0. What's the vector? 1, 3. Okay, now we'll do the same thing for lambda equals 3. Okay, so I'm going to subtract 3, so that's 1 minus 1, 3 minus 3, times some vector, we're going to get out 0, 0. What does that? 1, 1. OK. So the punchline. The first solution looks like e to the eigenvalue t. That's e to the t, 1, 3. Our second solution looks like e to the 3t, and our eigenvector, 1, 1. OK, I'm going to grab another piece of paper here. So, using our formula, we find phi. And so the way you find phi is you're going to construct it. Your columns are solutions. So don't forget to put the e to the t's inside. So it's e to the t, three, whoops, e to the t, got ahead of myself, 3e to the t. And the next one, e to the 3t, e to the 3t. Okay? That's our phi of t. What else do we need to compute? The inverse of phi is 0. So we'll start by just doing phi of 0. Phi of 0, 1, 1, 3, 1. Phi of 0 inverse. 
So know how to take the inverse of a two by two matrix. You start by one over the determinant, which is one subtract three, which is negative two. Swap the diagonal entries, which isn't really much to see in this case. Off diagonals, flip the signs. Now, if in doubt, what can you do? Multiply the two together. What should you get? You should get the identity. But we don't have any doubt. We're confident. So negative a half. You can leave the negative half on the outside. One, negative one, negative three, one. Okay, so we have that e to the at, what we're after is our phi of t, phi zero inverse, because we know how to use our formula sheet. The formula sheet is our friend. e to the 3t, e to the 3t, times negative a half, one, negative three, negative one, one. Now this negative a half, you never have to put it inside. You bring it out front. But you do have to do the matrix multiplication. Okay, so. We have to multiply two by two matrices. E to the t, subtract three e to the three t, right? Boom, boom. Then minus e to the t, plus e to the three t. Then three e to the t, subtract three e to the three t, and minus 3 e to the t plus e to the 3t. And now what do we do? We're done with part A. So this, this is the answer to part A. All right. Good. Good times. Any questions for that one? All right, nice. Uh, I'm going to have to recombobulate later on. Okay, let's get into part B. All right, so what's the first thing you have to do? Got to find the eigenvalues. We need to know what our case is. So 4 minus lambda minus 2, 2 minus lambda, taking that determinant. That gives you lambda squared minus 4 lambda plus 4 equals 0. Does this factor? How does it factor? Lambda minus 2, lambda minus 2. So that says our eigenvalues are repeated. Nice. So we have a different case. So we're here. Okay. So what do we do? We write down the answer. That's how cool it is. We don't even have to work hard. We say, okay, well, e to the at is e to the lambda t, lambda is 2, so that's e to the 2t, times the identity, 1, 0, 0, 1, plus t, a subtract lambda i. So we're going to imagine you come here and just put in lambda equals 2. So it would be 4 minus 2 is 2, minus 2, 2, minus 2. Which you can go one step more, squeeze it into one matrix, e to the 2t, 1 plus 2t, minus 2t, 2t, 1 minus 2t. And we're done. We found e to the at. Okay, so B, B was quick. All right, any questions for B? Like this? I, I would encourage you to get to here, but technically this is a correct answer. Okay, so we're left with part C. 
All right, let's do part C. Okay, so again, 4 minus lambda, minus 5, 1 minus lambda. This is lambda squared minus 4 lambda plus 5. Does that factor? No. All right. So what do we do? Well, so we, uh, well, we can throw it to the quadratic formula. Negative b plus minus the square root b squared minus 4ac. So 4 times 1 times 5 is 20 all over 2a. 60 minus 20 is negative 4. Square root of negative 4? 2i. So you have 4 over 2, which is 2. 2i over 2, which is i. Oh, what are the odds? We're in the third case. 2 plus minus i. Uh, and what do we do? Yeah, we write down the answer. That's how quick it is. So let's be careful here. Alpha is the real part. So alpha is 2. Beta is the imaginary part. What's beta? One. Okay, so we have, according to our formula, e to the at is e to the alpha t, so that's e to the 2t, cosine beta t, that's cosine t, times the identity, 1, 0, 0, 1. 1 over beta is 1. So then we have e to the 2t sine of t, because e to the alpha, is, that's 2, sine beta, that's 1. And then it's a subtract, now not lambda, but the alpha. So we're going to take a subtract 2, right, because alpha is 2. So that would be 2 minus 5, 1 minus 2. Yes? So far, so good? And we're done, right? I'll go ahead and just squeeze it into one matrix. e to the 2t cosine t plus 2 e to the 2t sine t minus 5 e to the 2t sine t. Down next row, e to the 2t sine t. And then we have e to the 2t cosine t minus 2 e to the 2t sine t. There's our exponential. Okay, so I want to come back. Why do we love e to the at? Why are we just happy when we see it? What's special about e to the at? So like when we thought about it before we did matrix stuff, we had an unknown constant times t to the whatever number times t. So the at is the kind of representing that solution. So, so yeah, e to the at deals with solutions. So e to the at is a fundamental matrix, but it's not just any fundamental matrix. It's the kind of fundamental matrix that you'd like to take home to meet the family. Mom, dad, I met a really nice fundamental matrix. It's a great one. So what's special? So special, the columns of e to the at are the solutions of x prime equals ax. That's one cool property, but it gets even better. So the solution to x prime equals ax with initial condition x of 0 is e to the at times x of 0. So if you have an initial value problem and you can generate the exponential matrix, then you can find the particular solution really fast. Let's go back to a problem. Now, 
Number five, we'll start with number five. And let's suppose we found the eigenvalues are five, five. Okay, so we've already done that. So number five, eigenvalues are five and five. Now we're going to do it a different way. So previously we said, hey, let's find our, our general form. Let's skip all that. Let's use exponential matrix to solve it. So how do we use exponential matrix to solve it? Well, we say, look, we know how to find e to the a t. We have our, our nifty formula. That's e to the lambda t times identity plus t a minus lambda i. So we say, well, that's e to the 5t times 1, 0, 0, 1 plus t. And now we take a subtract 5. So that's 2, 4, minus 1, minus 2. So that's e to the 5t, 1 plus 2t, 4, minus t, and 1 minus 2t. Now, we have an initial condition. What do we do next? Yeah, so our answer x looks like e to the a t x zero. So that's e to the five t, one plus two t, four, minus t, one minus two t, times three, one. All right, well, the e to the 5t can stay out front. 1 plus 2t times 3, that's 3 plus 6t. And then we have a plus 4. Uh, whoops, I forgot a t here. That's 4t plus 4t minus 3t and uh, 1 minus 2t. So that leaves us with e to the 5t, 3 plus 10t, and 1 minus 5t. And now what do we do? Yeah, you're done. Should we compare? e to the 5t, 10t plus 3, minus 5t plus 1. It's the same. Now, let's compare the two. Would you rather do this or this? Okay, you can do that, that's fine. No, 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 come on. The punchline is use your tools. E to the AT is a good tool. Okay, so that's the other way to do number five. Can we talk about number four? Haha, -ha, too bad, you don't get a choice. You have to hear it. That's your, the, the cost of coming today. You have to learn. I didn't want to learn. You have to learn. Okay, so number four. So number four, let's suppose we know our eigenvalues are three plus minus two i. Okay, so we got to lambda equals three plus minus two i. What do we do? Well, now we're gonna find e to the at again. So e to the a t, that's e alpha t, so that's 3t cosine beta t times the identity plus 1 over beta, that's a half, e to the alpha t sine beta t, and then I'm going to times that by uh, the matrix subtract alpha i. So I'm going to subtract 3. So 2 minus 3 is minus 1, 1, minus 5, 1. So um, this is our formula. e to the alpha t cosine beta t i, 1 over beta e to the alpha t sine beta t a minus alpha i. So then we put it together into a single matrix. We get e to the 3t cosine 2t minus a half e to the 3t 
sine 2t, and then we get 1 half e to the 3t sine of 2t. Then on the other line, we have minus 5 halves e to the 3t sine 2t, and e to the 3t cosine 2t plus a half e to the 3t sine 2t. Now what happens? Remember, what are we after? General form. So what do we do? General form, you grab the columns. Column 1, column 2. So the general form looks like some constant C times the first column. The only hard part about this test, well, I won't say the only hard part, but one of the hardest parts about this test, there's a lot of copying. And so, inevitably, when people come back and say, where did I make a mistake? A lot of times it's a copying mistake. So take your time and just make sure you copied everything correctly. But anyways, some constant times first solution plus some constant times our second solution. Are we done? Almost, but not quite, because we have to go back and unravel it. So how do we unravel? We just read off the entries. So you get x equals some constant, e to the 3t cosine 2t minus 1 half e to the 3t sine 2t plus some constant times 1 half e to the 3t sine of 2t and y is some constant c, negative 5 halves, e to the 3t sine of 2t, and a constant d, e to the 3t cosine 2t, plus 1 half e to the 3t sine of 2t. And you are done. That is the solution. Now there's a couple comments. Uh, is this faster? Yes. Are you more or less likely to make mistakes? Less likely if you, as long as you copy. Does this look exactly like the solution we wrote down? No. Does that mean it's wrong? No, they're both right. That's one of the things. Sometimes you can write equivalent answers in different ways. Life is fun that way. Um, so anyways, that's the other way to do number four. So you can use... Whenever you're looking for a general form and you see anything with either repeated or complex, or if you're after, uh, so, so yeah, let's just say it using this part right here. If you're after a specific solution and you're in either the repeated or complex, I strongly encourage you, use the exponential matrix. If you're looking for general form and you're either repeated or complex, Use the exponential matrix. It's really a wonderful shortcut. It will save you much time. And I will go ahead and tell you now, because we're all friends here, there are three cases that you might find yourself in when you're dealing with the two by two matrix. You see them listed here. Real distinct, repeated, complex. You will encounter each of these three cases on the exam. There are three things we may ask you to do. Find a particular solution. Find the general form. Find an exponential matrix. You will encounter each one of those three things on the exam. Now, I don't know how they'll match up, but you will encounter these things. So know them all. So this brings us to number seven. Oh, number seven. Okay. Uh, use the method of undetermined coefficients for systems to find the general form for solutions of, and you have x prime is 1, 1, 0, 2, x plus 5 e to the t, 2 e to the t. Okay. All right. So um, this one, I'm, I'm kind of going to channel my inner desire to teach a little bit here because something. This is not a random solution, a random problem. But is it okay in the interest of time that I, I quickly go through 
the steps. And I'll just hit the highlights. Because at this point in time, we want to get to the highlights. We're going to channel what we learned about from the last test for undetermined coefficients. So now what we have here is we have this is a, a non-homogeneous part. And so the first step is to say, well, let's handle the homogeneous solution. So I say, OK, the homogeneous portion. And since we're really good, this is why I'm not going to feel terrible about going through this one a little bit quicker. So x prime is 1, 1, 0, 2, x. So you, you drop the non-homogeneous part. And the eigenvalues here are 1 and 2. And in fact, if you, if you do the eigenvectors, they're, they're not particularly exciting. For lambda equals 1, the eigenvector is 1, 0. And for lambda equals 2, the eigenvector is 1, 1. And, and you can verify this again just in the interest of time, because this is not the, the big punchline here. OK, so for the homogeneous part, we sometimes call this the complementary solution, xc. We have some constant c times e to the t, 1, 0, plus some constant d, uh, e to the 2t, 1, 1. Okay, so that's the homogeneous portion. So now we come to the undetermined coefficients. Now, undetermined coefficients, how do you go about solving that? Again, we'll channel what we learned before. What do you do? And the answer is, we're going to make a list. We're making a list. And, uh, okay, so I guess we'll, we'll quickly say our steps. One, make a list. Two, do we have powers to deal with? Three, do we have sine slash cosine to deal with? And four, do we have overlap to deal with? Okay. Now, the first three steps, nothing changes. So no surprises. So let's talk about our, our list that we're forming here. So we think about the non-homogeneous part, pull out the functions. So the things which depend on t. So the only function we really have is e to the t times the vector 5, 2. So think of this 5, 2 as that's what's acting like a constant. So when we're talking about the functions, we want the things which are varying with t. So we pull apart our, our non-homogeneous portion. And we say the only function that shows up is e to the t. So on our list, we have e to the t. OK, so that's our list, initial list. That's the function showing up inside the non-homogeneous part. So we go through the next pieces. OK, we have e to the t. Are there any powers of t in the front? No, there's not. Wonderful news. Are there any sines, cosines? No. Wonderful news. If there were, we'd have to pair them up. Is there an overlap? Well, what are, are our functions over here? Our functions are e to the t and e to the 2t. So is there any overlap? Yes. OK, so now, how do you deal with overlap? OK, so this is the place where things differ. Do we bump? Yes. And no. What does that mean? So normally, last test we'd say, e to the t becomes t e to the t. We just bump it up. Now we keep it. We add to our list. So we don't just move up that one individual piece and keep one piece. We add extra material. So this is the difference between method of undetermined coefficients from the last part of the class versus this part of the class. And people often ask, do you have to do that? And the answer is yes. Can I convince you? I, I, can, I can spend 20 minutes showing you that the answer is yes. 
by actually doing this example. Should we do it? All right, good. We're in learning mode. Think of all this super knowledge. Okay, so let's suppose we just had e to the t. So just e to the t. So that says we think that our particular solution, well, has the form e to the t times a vector, a, b. And we plug it into both sides. We say, okay, well, it's easy to take that derivative. Uh, so x, p prime would be e to the t times the vector a, b. So this is our x, p prime. Uh, and we need it to equal 1, 1, 0, 2 times e to the t a, b plus 5 e to the t, 2 e to the t. Well, all right, so if you clean this up, everything has an e to the t, so you can just pull that out in front. And you're going to get here a plus b plus 5 more. So a plus b plus 5. And here you're going to get 0 plus 2b, so 2b and plus 2. So, in order for this to be true, this says, oh, well, you'd have to have a equals a plus b plus 5, and we'd have to have b equals 2b plus 2. What does the first equation tell us? b is negative 5. What does the second equation tell us? b is negative 2. So all we need for this to be true is that negative 5 equals negative 2. Wah, wah, wah. Can't work. So just e to t not gonna happen. Okay, so you're like, ah, oh, Steve, we already knew that you had to bump. Bump, bump it up, bump. Oh, right, okay. So what about just t e to the t? So in other words, do it like we had before. So now we have t e to the t times a b. Okay, so we're gonna run through it again. Okay, so x p prime, well, uh, well, you just have to take the root of t e to the t. That's e to the t a b plus t e to the t a b. So this is our x p prime. That has to equal our 1, 1, 0, 2 times t e to the t a b plus 5 e to the t 2 e to the t. Well, that gets you t e to the t and the only place where t, e to the t shows up is there, times a plus b and 2b, plus e to the t, 5, 2. All right, does this work? Well, what would have to be true? What would have to be true is this e to the t, a, b, would have to match this e to the t, 5, 2. So what do we need A to be equal to? And what does we need B to be equal to? Two. But simultaneously, this T E to the T A B has to match this T E to the T A plus B to B, which means that we need A equals A plus B and B equals 2B. What is this information telling us? We need b equals 0. So we just need b equals 0 and b equals 2. When does that happen? Never. Ah, it failed again. So we know we have this e to the t, so we expect it e to the t. But e to the t by itself won't work. Well, yeah, it has overlap. So if you bump like before, say, oh, now just have t e to the t, that would work. No, 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 it's not enough. You have to add. So it's not just moving up, it's not just old bumping, you have to expand your list. So this is the difference. So, so this is not just overlap, 
you should think of it as overlap plus plus or something. It's just, you have to remember, there's a different way to handle overlap. It's just not bumping. There's extra pieces involved. Okay, so that's an example that shows why you have to have both parts. Individually, it doesn't work. But together, I claim it does. So we claim XP should look like e to the t times some vector plus t e to the t times some vector. And now we're just going to go through, and I claim we're going to be able to solve for a, b, c, d in this case. All right, so this is, uh, you take your time, x, p prime. That turns out to be e to the t, a, b, e to the t, c, d, t, e to the t, c, d. So this is your x, p prime is equal to 1, 1, 0, 2 times e to the t a b plus t e to the t c d plus 5 e to the t 2 e to the t, which you expand, that's e to the t a plus b 2b plus t e to the t c plus d, 2d, and plus uh, e to the t, whoops, e to the t, yeah, 5, 2. Okay. Well, I will say, once you understand about the, 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 the bumping is slightly different, everything else is the same. So you, you take a superposition of your things in the list, but the superposition now, you have unknown vectors instead of unknown constants. You plug it in and you're solving for those vectors. So that's what we're doing right now. We're solving for these vectors. So we do it by grouping the functions. So we have the functions e to the t, a plus c, b plus d, and t e to the t. We do that grouping on both sides. So e to the t, a plus b plus 5, 2b plus 2, and t e to the t, c plus d, 2d, and we start comparing. Okay, so we compare coefficients. So we have that the vector c, d has to line up with the vector c plus d, 2d. So that tells us C needs to equal C plus D, and that D needs to equal 2 times D. All right, well, can we think of any vectors, or can we glean any information from this? Okay, so we can come to the conclusion that D equals 0. And that tells us that C is C. True story, C is C. All right, but we also have other pieces of information. So maybe C will be found out in a moment here. Okay, we're told, I'll start with the bottom part. B plus D is equal to 2B plus 2. But we already know that D is 0. So B has to equal 2B plus 2. What does that tell us about B? B is negative 2. And we have then A plus C has to equal A plus B plus 5. Okay. So the A's cancel. That tells us that C has to equal B plus 5. But we know B is negative 2. So what is C? C equals 3. And what about A? What do we know about that? Is there any restriction for A? So right now it appears that A is arbitrary. And that's because 
it's arbitrary. And we'll see why in a second. All right. So let me update what we have. So we have that our xp, which looks like e to the t, we don't have anything for a. There's no restriction for a. a minus 2 plus t e to the t, 3, 0. So there's our particular solution. Now, let's compare our homogeneous solution. xc looks like some constant e to the t, 1, 0, plus some constant e to the 2t, 1, 1. Now, looking at our xc and our xp, why does it feel like A can be an arbitrary choice? If you like, we can write this as e to the t times a times 1, 0, plus e to the t times 0, negative 2, plus t e to the t, 3, 0. What does this look like? It's part of the homogeneous part, which can happen. That can happen. So that's why A is an arbitrary choice. Essentially, we're, we're sort of capturing a piece of the homogeneous solution. OK, so our punchline here, if we go back to what we were looking for, we were after general form. So we say, well, we found the homogeneous. We found the particular. So then our general form looks like our particular solution plus our homogeneous solution. We can drop the repeated part, so we can drop this, that's overlap. So that's e to the t, 0, negative 2, plus t e to the t, 3, 0, plus some constant c, e to the t, 1, 0, plus some constant e to the 2t, 1, 1. And that's our answer. Ta-da! All right. So this is an example of just saying, be careful with how you handle overlap. But other than that, the procedure is remarkably similar to what we did in the last exam. Same ideas, same ideas. Just be careful with how you handle overlap. All right. Any questions on that one? OK. And that brings us then to our final problem. Yay! Oh wait, it doesn't. Oh yeah, this will be posted today. Yeah, as long as it recorded. I hope it recorded. We'll find out later. That's not an, an us problem. All right, number eight, our final problem. Use the method of variation of parameters for systems to find a particular solution of dx dt. So in case you don't know, what does this notation, how do we often write dx dt? Yeah, so that's just a, another way to write x prime. x prime is 2 minus 1, 5 minus 2x, plus here we have tangent t0. So this is a non-homogeneous. So variation of parameters is essentially saying, how do we handle non-homogeneous, and in particular, a non-homogeneous part which is not nice. So not nice means, for instance, the functions involved are unpleasant to work with. So they're not exponentials, or powers of t, or sines or cosines. So tangent is not a nice function. OK, so what is variation of parameters? Well, the punchline is, it's this. This is the formula. This is what we mean by variation of parameters. And if it looks very familiar, or even vaguely familiar, if you go back to week two of the class, that's how we start solving differential equations, is essentially that formula. We may not have written that formula down explicitly, but that's the formula we started with. So all of our work for the last few weeks has been to turn our little a's into big a's. That's a lot of work went into that. But we got there. Little a's have become big a's. All right, so what do we do? Well, we're just going to literally do the formula. So that's it. 
Okay, cool. How hard could that be? Well, we need to find e to the at, we need to find e to the minus at, and then we just need to keep slowly grinding through the problem. So our a, that's 2 minus 1, 5 minus 2. Well, we have to find our eigenvalues. So we start there. So we have our determinant 2 minus lambda, minus 1, 5, minus 2 minus lambda. And uh, so that becomes 2 minus lambda times minus 2 minus lambda, and then subtract minus 1 times 5. Whoops, ran out of space there. But okay, if we expand this out, this becomes lambda squared, minus 2 lambda plus 2 lambda cancel. Ooh, they cancel. Nice. Then we have minus 4 plus 5, which makes plus 1. So that tells us that lambda is plus minus i. Okay, these are nice. Now they're complex, but when things are complex, among things which are complex, I should say, these are as good as you can hope for. Okay, so we need to find e to the at. Well, we're not going to go through and, and do anything fancy. We're going to use our formula sheet. And we say, okay, here, alpha is 0, beta is 1. Right? 0 plus minus 1 times i. So then e to the at, that's e to the 0t, which goes away, cosine beta t, so that's cosine t, 1, 0, 0, 1. 1 over beta is 1. e to the 0t sine beta t makes sine t. And then we're going to take a minus alpha i. Well, alpha is 0, so it's just a. 2 minus 1, 5 minus 2. So we end up with our e to the at is cosine t plus 2 sine t minus sine t, 5 sine of t, and cosine t minus 2 sine t. Okay. So not too bad. Not too bad. We also need e to the minus at. Now that sounds like we could put a lot of work or we make it easy on ourselves. So e to the minus at, we should think of this as e to the a of negative t. So everywhere where you see a t, put negative t. So that would be cosine of negative t plus 2 sine of negative t minus sine of negative t, 5 sine of negative t, and cosine of negative t minus 2 sine of negative t. Okay. Ah, ran out of space. Okay. But the nice thing is cosine and sine, these are nice functions. We, we've, we've hung around these functions. We know how they behave. Some of them are even. Some of them are even odder. So cosine t, t minus 2 sine t, then sine t, negative 5 sine t, and cosine t plus 2 sine t. Okay, so that's e to the minus a t. All right. So far so good? I think that's about a third of the work. Now, we're going to go through, and this problem, from the rest of it, is just computation. We're after the particular solution, so when we integrate, we can assume our constants are zero. We're going to just think of it as an onion problem. There's layers. And as with onions, there may be tears involved, but that's okay. What are our layers? Just our first layer, we're going to do e to the minus at times f of t. Then our second layer is the integral. Then our third layer is the multiplication. Those are our three layers. Okay, so we start with our inner layer. e to the minus at 
f of t. So we're going to do a lot of copying here. Cosine t minus 2 sine t sine of t minus 5 sine of t cosine t plus 2 sine t tangent of t 0. Now this becomes, well the good news is we have a 0 so that's going to help. Uh, cosine t tangent t minus 2 sine t tangent t 0 minus 5 sine t tangent t 0. Okay, so that's our e to the minus at. So we should make some notes here. We need to figure out how to integrate that. So let's take a second and pause and think about how would we rewrite cosine t tangent t to make it easier to integrate. What's another way to think about this one? It's sine, right? Because tangent is sine over cosine. So the cosines cancel, so you're left with sine. So that's good. That'll make it possible. How about sine t tangent t? Hmm. That's the same as sine squared over cosine, yes? How would we think about rewriting that to make it friendlier to integration? Well, what's another way to write sine squared? One minus cosine squared. One over cosine, secant. Cosine squared over cosine, cosine. Okay, so we're going to, wherever we see a cosine t times a tangent t, it's going to become a sine t. Where we see a sine t times a tangent t, it's going to become the secant t minus cosine t. So, updating, we have, this is in, in anticipation of our next step, e to the minus a t f of t, is, so sine t minus two times this expression, so minus two secant t and plus two cosine t. Downstairs it's minus five times this expression, so minus five secant t plus five cosine t. Okay, so that's our first layer with some work getting ready for our second layer. So now we go and do our second layer. The integral e to the minus a t f of t dt. Well, we integrate everything we just wrote down. And the good news is that integration happens term by term. And we came prepared. Oops. Put that in parentheses. Okay. So the integral of sine. There's no more integral. We've actually integrated. Integral of sine. Negative cosine. Integral of secant. It's on our equation sheet. Log secant plus tangent. Of course. Of course. The integral of cosine is sine. And because we're after a particular solution, we don't worry about constants. So normally we'd write plus c, we can assume our constants are zero. Integral of secant, again, log secant plus tangent. Integral of cosine is sine. All right, so we've, we've now done our second layer. Let's recall what our layers were. So we start with the inside. We found e to the minus at f of t. Rewrote it so that we could integrate it. We then integrated, so we're one step away. We have to multiply by e to the at. Okay, so our last thing is our particular solution is e to the at. So I have to find that. 
I think, let me see if I can squeeze it on the screen. So here's our e to the at. So cosine t plus 2 sine t minus sine t 5 sine t cosine t minus 2 sine t times this wonderful, beautiful expression we just found. Ah, this is the kind of problem you only ever want to do once in your life, but you should always do it once. And this is your once. It's like, yes, I've done it, and I'll never have to do this kind of problem again. Okay, so it's e to the at, so we're just writing, copying down what e to the at is, times what we found. So, this equals, here we go, cosine t plus 2 sine t times this first piece, minus cosine t minus 2 log secant t plus tangent t plus 2 sine t. All right, first term, then boom, right? So subtract sine t times 5 log secant t plus tangent t plus 5 sine t. All right, that's the first entry. Then the second entry, 5 sine t times all of that minus cosine t minus 2 log secant t plus tangent t plus 2 sine t. And then our next part is cosine t minus 2 sine t times that minus 5 log secant plus tangent plus 5 sine t. And what do we do here? Yeah, we're just going to stop. It's like we've got the answer. Ha! They didn't say simplify as much as possible, so we're done. It, it does simplify a little bit, but it's not worth it. You're probably thinking, it wasn't worth it a long time ago, Steve. <laughs> but uh, like I said, you should always see one of these once. Um, okay. <sighs> and that is the end. All right. You've seen all the ideas. So, all right. Thank you for being patient and for hanging around. <laughs>